have questions either for Jessica or Michael. Yes. I have one for each of you. Let's see if this works. Yes. Um, if, if I can start asking you, Michael, this. Um, I mean, seen from an ecological point of view, you would think that if you were, um, if you were isolated, you would go looking for someone to hang out with. So did you see or did you measure whether these isolated flies moved around more? I mean, they slept less, but did that actually mean that they, you could sort of interpret it ecologically as, as, as if they were trying to find uh, others? Right, so we, we have looked at whether they um, showed more motion, more movement mm -hmm. uh, during the waking time, and they don't. Uh, but then they may know it's futile to look for others because they're in a tube by themselves. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, I think it must be a, a pretty strong signal that something's very wrong if none of your compatriots are around. I mean, it's, it, it strikes me as something that would have pretty deep evolutionary roots. Uh, yes. know, why would this happen? Why is this a, why is this a benefit? And, you know, if everybody's gone, maybe that's a pretty good signal that um, something catastrophic is at hand. So what do you do to protect yourself if you're a fly? You know, you stay alert and you yeah. consume as much food as you can handle. But this is a good, uh, it might be interesting to put them in arena and see what kinds of interactions um, emerge on being reunited. You know, we know that if we re reunite them, that the problem, that sleep comes back to normal and appetite comes back to normal. But we haven't looked at the behavioral aspects of, <clears throat> uh, you know, did they show some level of uh, uh, extra effort to get back to their colleagues? Yeah, it would be interesting. If, if the cage was bigger, maybe it would be possible to study yeah. something like yeah. that. I don't know. Uh, may I also ask a question for Jessica? I was uh, super interesting with this focus on taxon taxonomy and, and collections. I think that is a very undercommunicated um, issue, the fact that we need these collections um, for so much of, of our science. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, do you have any ideas of how we can work to get more students to study taxonomy and become taxonomists? Good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, uh, we actually talked about it a little bit during the lunchtime discussion about what was considered to be a womanly pursuit, was often to go out and collect feathers and shells and create cabinets of curiosity. And there was a history in entomology of, of, um, of this being something that could be an ex excellent pastime, you know, to do taxonomy and to, we like to sort things, we like to categorize things. I think somebody showed yesterday their, their child kind of identifying differences That's amongst so. animals. We love doing that. Um, and somehow we get away from the idea that taxonomy is cool by the time we reach high school. Um, so I think it has to start from a very early age, perhaps, um, underscoring that systematics and taxonomy is important. It's not dusty. It's not something from the past. You know, we're still actively discovering species. I mean, I feel kind of like Indiana Jones, you know, you're kind of like going out and exploring and doing and, and really discovering new species can be exciting. We just don't communicate that. We, we imagine taxonomists kind of as the two characters in Silence of the Lambs who are just kind of, uh, you know, deprived from sun, just sitting in a dark room, you know, looking at fly maggots. That's not what systematics is. You know, systematics is a vibrant science. It includes, you know, biochemistry and genomics and genetics and morphology um, and histology. It's, it's, it's more than just staring at an insect um, in a vial or on a pin. Uh, so we need to kind of glamorize uh, the, you know, taxonomy, I think, from a very early age. Thank you. Yes, yeah, I think this is a, a question for Michael, primarily. A, a big theme in your work clearly is finding surprising commonalities between fruit flies and humans, including these extraordinary data you were just presenting about social isolation leading to loss of sleep in both cases. I'm curious about how this has changed the way you see the flies as individual 
creatures and whether it's changed the way you treat them, whether, for example, it might, have, you know, it might lead you in the future to think, let's be careful about keeping these flies in socially isolated conditions. Yeah. Well, this is the first thing my wife brought up when I showed her the data. You know, these little flies have some kind of an emotion, emotional response. And of course, that's, a, that's, a, um, that's one way uh, to look at it. And, and you know, it, it's, uh, when I was in college, I can remember that it, you were always, uh, there was a lot of pushback if you ever tried anthropomorphic. Uh, uh, kinds of thoughts were always uh, pushed back. But, you know, the more homologies you see, uh, the more you think, why would you rebuild the system from scratch? And so if this is the way you can get a certain behavior, uh, then why wouldn't it, why wouldn't it apply to a, a, another organism? So uh, are they depressed, you know, in any, anything like the way uh, we would think about it? And I think, I think it's a real possibility there's something like that going on. Uh, one of the things that I'd really like to understand, and we've, we're still struggling with ways to pursue it, is uh, when we turn those neurons off and make the responses go back to baseline, have we relieved the stress of social isolation? Is they, or are we just, is the animal still in distress, but we've cut off its ability to, uh, to express that. And I think I'm, I'm, I lean to the side of the, the former, where, we've, where you know, the easiest explanation for losing two different responses, I think, is to say you've, you've relieved the stress that was associated with the problem. It also brings up you know, questions about uh, humane tra treatment of prisoners. You know, uh, isolation. Uh, may be a, uh, a form of treatment that has many more connotations than we originally, you know, you throw somebody into to isolation and, uh, you know, in the penal system, for example, is this an added form of punishment that was not appreciated before? And I mean, I'm sure we'd all agree that in the case of humans, social isolation raises serious ethical yeah. concerns. Yeah. I mean, do you see this as having practical implications for how you treat the, the flies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, it, you know, it rang strong. We didn't, you know, this, this story wasn't told yet when you were uh, talking about these things, but I was, as I was thinking about our own work, I, I could understand where the question was coming from. And it goes back to this question, you know, is it one chicken or one fly? What's the difference? Is it the weight of the animal? Or is it the response that is elicited by whatever insult you uh, produce? I guess that's maybe why uh, there was concern about, um, you know, raising millions of insects instead of one chicken. Or were you, was that a, a stronger ethical position? And I think that's a difficult question. Hopefully, we'll know more about what's going on in Fly's head from yeah. in the future. How, can I ask a question related to that? It's a technical question. It's a quick one, I think. Yep. So, um, have you? These were, I, I assume, like a lab reared strain. Yeah. Some of them were. Okay. Yeah. Some of them were were uh, isolated okay. uh, uh, from nature. Like, okay. And. Uh, oh, okay. I hope that's better. <laughs> uh, some of the strains that we tested were isolated from nature, and particularly those that had naturally longer or shorter intervals of sleep. So as I was saying, like many individuals, human individuals, that will tell you that they have uh, lesser or greater requirements for sleep. And um, it really didn't matter, and as I was, as I was saying, the. Uh, uh, this wasn't just limited to Drosophila melanogaster. We saw it in several Drosophila species. So um, we haven't gone beyond that, but we probably should. And I was just thinking because I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about their ecological um, aspects of Drosophila, right? That they often do feed together. I know yeah. that they're often on, are on the fruit together. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if you suddenly end up that you're the only one on the fruit, 
I'm just wondering if it's loneliness or like maybe, like you said, maybe something's wrong and I should be going somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, just to push back on your loneliness yeah. just a little bit, because sure. this is what we're supposed to do here. Sure. Um, no, no, I agree. I mean, maybe it, it is that the reason that the metabolism and everything is upregulated because the fly is going, all right, there's something wrong with this food because I'm the only one here. Maybe I need to fly somewhere else, but of course they can't because they're in your tube. Um, I'm just, just curious. No, I agree. I how agree. You'd respond. It's almost as if you need a taster, you know. It's, you know yeah, is like if safe? you're the only one is in the safe? restaurant, you look in the restaurant. You always look in a restaurant. And if there's there's nobody in there, you think yeah. maybe I shouldn't be eating here. Yeah. yeah, I'm just wondering if that's it's a similar. So it's not loneliness, but kind of like maybe this is really there's something wrong with this food. Yeah. So. Only these guys are eating. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but so, then I mean, but I, I, I yeah. take your point because who knows what the response to that kind of stress would be, but you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Second, you had a yes. question? So my question to, is to Jessica. Uh, so I was really, uh, thanks for the excellent presentation, but I was really struck by the colors, the variety of colors of dragonflies. And I was sitting, thinking, why would they have evolutionarily that type of color, knowing that uh, uh, maybe there will be the next meal to a variety of these uh, uh, other organisms. So why do they at want to attract attention with the colors? Or do they ha does the colors have any uh, impact on that? Wh why do they have that color? Yeah, Those oh, colors, yeah. That is a good question. And color is a really big part of the story of dragonflies. And there's two main types of color. Structural color, where there's kind of bumps and ridges on the cuticle. When light bounces off of it, eyes can perceive it as being kind of a metallic or shiny color. Um, and then there's the coloration that is granules of pigment inside their epithelial cells that can migrate up and down. And that actually, dragonflies are able to kind of change their color. Yeah. So they can be what's called bright phase, where they are a very bright color. And they can be what's called a dark phase, or a very dark color. And we don't exactly know the purpose of all of their color, but we know that their eyes are capable of seeing a wide range of colors. So we think communication is part of it. Um, some of the color patterns on their wings, we see behaviors that dragonflies do where they kind of flash their wing patterns. And we think that there's sexual you know, communication that's taking place. Um, but we also think thermoregulation is part of it. So um, dragonflies that are quite cold tend to be in dark phase. Um, and early in the morning, when you first find dragonflies, they tend to be in dark phase. And we think that perhaps they're absorbing as much sunlight as they can and heat because they need to have a certain amount of energy for their, their flight muscles to kind of whir and for them to be able to take off in flight. Um, and indeed, you know, frogs jump out of the water to catch them, fish jump out of the water to catch them. And there are some dragonflies and damselflies, they're all doing this kind of mating dance at the water. Very vulnerable time for them. Um, and there are some like R.J. apicalis, which is a damselfly, that as soon as they complete mating, they actually go from bright phase um, to dark phase. And some, like Amanda Wispel did her PhD on this. She argued that this was so that you could avoid being seen by predators. So they, they're, it's a very complex story, the story of color in dragonflies. Um, but we think a lot of it is this combination of thermoregulation and communication. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I have another question from the audience for you, Jessica. Um, the research you've, you and your colleagues have done on, on dragonflies is, is fascinating, and it's, it's complex. And um, the question is, are there similar types of exploration of the systematics of other insects, perhaps some that aren't quite as, as charismatic as we might consider odinates to be? For sure. I mean, there are systematists study all different types of insects, um, but there may not be as many of them. So there are groups of entomologists who spent their whole life studying lice. You know, they collect lice, uh, they dissect lice, they do genomics of lice, um, but they don't have big international lice meetings the way that we have big international <laughs> dragonfly meetings. Well, take they place. do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every meeting could be a lice meeting if you, if you have lice. Um, so there are entomologists who study different groups, but there are, I would say that the one common lament is that uh, if you look at all across all of, all, all of entomologists if, and you look at what they study, a majority of them study social insects, so bees, ants, and wasps. Very few, uh, relatively speaking, entomologists study the evolution of termites, even though they are social. Um, 
a lot of people study butterflies. Butterflies are large, charismatic animals. Um, and if we look at those, those two groups, social, that relates to humans, and beautiful, you know, butterflies, and we like beautiful things. So things like earwigs, things like um, various, like for arachnology, various ear mites, uh, you know, head lice, pubic lice, these are things that people spend far less time pondering, but they have an evolutionary trajectory that's really interesting and fascinating too. So I would say there's an entomologist for every kind of insect, but the number of entomologists for some insect groups is really high, and the relative number of entomologists for other insect groups is really low. So coming back to your comment about reaching out to students, encouraging them to go into systematics, you need to be pursuing lice and yeah. fleas. <laughs> And earwigs. Absolutely. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. So when I started, that's going to get them in. <laughs> everybody loves a lice biologist. I will say, my I had a graduate student years ago who's now a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His name is Dominic Evangelista, and he said he really wanted to study. He was interested in cockroaches, and he really wanted to study cockroaches. I said there is almost no one studying the social behavior of of the subsocial roaches. Um, there's very few people that are studying the evolutionary behavior, the evolutionary trajectory of, of cockroaches. If you go and study cockroaches, you could be like the cockroach person. And he really liked that idea, you know, of becoming the cockroach person. And now he kind of is the cockroach person, um, in the States at least. And so if you like the idea of being an expert on a group, um, there's a lot of groups for which we don't really have kind of living experts because unfortunately we lose taxonomists um, and we lose expertise. So there's probably a beetle group that hasn't been studied since the 1920s that you could be the expert on. Um, you just need to dip your toe into entomology. Uh, I think earwigs could do a, a service to themselves if they would rename themselves because that's yeah. not a, yeah. oh. that doesn't mm -hmm. invite <laughs> participation. <laughs> Great. Uh, another question that has been <clears throat> this has been kind of a theme, I think, through all the talks is, um, so this is for uh, you two in particular, but, but really anybody on the panel. Um, why do the diverse experiences and perspectives of individuals who study insects influence the nature of what we learn, and why does this matter? That's a good question. I, I guess I could, do you want to dive in? Well, I was going to say, I think, uh, I mean, we've seen how, how different the perspectives are, the, the, the different focus uh, that's represented here. And I, I find it pretty refreshing uh, and something that we're, you know, many of us molecular biologists, you know, go to molecular biology meetings and, you know, talk molecular biology. This is, this is much more exciting. <laughs> so so uh, I, think it's, I think it's important to hear these different ways of, of looking at uh, biology, and uh, you know the the the, uh, the sense I get is maybe some of these uh, tracks or something that can be added on and mixed with uh, with what we're doing. So it's it's very valuable. I think in the area of systematics, one thing that we see for insects, certainly for dragonflies, is that traditionally when people talked about selection, they talked about sexual selection. Almost everything, and pardon me for talking about genitals again, but almost everything focused on male genitals and male control of reproduction. Um, so if you look at the, the kind of literature for insects, uh, for dragonflies in particular, dragonflies are unique because males have two penises. They have a penis at the tip of their abdomen, a secondary penis at the base of their, their at the beginning of their abdomen. Um, through which sperm is transferred. And people thought that was fascinating, and we kind of have focused a lot on male genitalia. But it turns out that female genitalia is actually fascinating, too. Uh, females have oh, uh, kind of, there's a lot of interesting yes. things. Females are able to store <laughs> sperm. Um, in some cases, uh, for dragonflies, they can store sperm for quite a long time. But in cases of things like termites, they can actually store them for decades, you know? So understanding how, you know, female reproductive system works is, has been largely overlooked. And there's many people, and only just now, that are trying to kind of understand this other half kind of of the piece of the story. And it's, I think it's because we're having a diversity of voices. Um, we're having kind of more gender parity in the scientists that are actually studying this, thinking maybe it's not all about the penis. Maybe there's something interesting that's happening in female reproduction as well. <laughs> I, um, every diverse background that comes into the field brings a new perspective. And with new perspectives, we ask new questions. And with new questions, we learn more. Um, and, I, and so to 
to go back to braiding sweetgrass, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer mentions how um, she wanted to study and how she, yes. and, and she went up to an advisor and he said, what do you want to study in graduate school? And, and what she had to learn was sort of how to speak academic, but what she, what she said she wanted to study was why goldenrod and whatever the purple flowers that go with it. So why do yellow flowers and purple flowers look so good together? And she was laughed at and, and, they were, and she was told that, you know, that's not a scientific question. But it comes, but we saw it was beautifully in your image and it's insects can see those colors better. And so it was her perspective of, of understanding the patterns in nature from her perspective. And she knew that purple and yellow happened together a lot. Mm -hmm. And so she, did, she needed help in, in the academic, like how do you form this into a, a testable question? But it was a genuine observation that deserved further, you know, looking into. Mm -hmm. Anyone who has not read Robin Wall Kimmerer is, is, um, in, is welcome to leave right now and rush out and start reading it because it is a spectacular book. Braiding, Sweetgrass, or really any of her works, but that one in particular. Anyone else have thoughts about Margaret's question? I think the answer is okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you know, we, we have to, to uh, go back to philosophy a little bit here. Um, and you can correct my pronunciation here, Lisa. <laughs> the philosopher Wittgenstein Good. Um, once said, if a lion could speak, we wouldn't be able to understand it. He would certainly have said the same thing is true for flies. By that, he meant that our worldview is too distant from other animals for us to understand them. Do you think he was wrong? Can we really learn to think like flies? Can we really recognize the joy of bees? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my, my advisor told me that you can. And, and we, and I mean, yeah, we're completely different. I agree. We can't see UV and, and polar rise light. I'm sorry, I had to just say this, but we live on the same planet. It's not like they're living on some other universe that we have. I, I agree, you know, maybe we'll find an alien species and we have no relationship to it because they have such a completely different world, but we live in the same world. We see the same blue and yellow flowers and the same, I mean, there, there are commonalities. Are, is everything the same? Are, you know, as I think, I think it was you that said that, you know, they don't have symphony orchestras and things like that, for sure, insects don't. But we can um, learn how they do, as I said, there's basic things that they have to do. They have to eat. Michael showed this so nicely in his talk. You know, they have to, they do sleep, most of them. There's a lot of their basic needs that are very similar to ours. And the way that they find food by foraging is not so unlike the way we find food. They just do it while flying, like Jessica's beautiful dragonflies do. But I, I don't, I, I think it's a, I think it also, this, it's a little bit, uh, this otherness that we create is also false. And it's also a little dangerous because the more we other, the more we also, you know, you had talked about this with humans, but I think it's also doing it with other, other animals as well, as if they're so different than us that we can't possibly understand them. And then that starts this process of not caring about them. Mm -hmm. And they are really important. So uh, yes, we can think like a fly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mike, uh, yeah. Jonathan. Yes, I, mean, I, I think uh, understanding comes in degrees. Mm -hmm. There may be aspects of the ways of life of insects that we will always wonder about and that we'll always struggle to understand. If you think about something as, as basic as seeing the plane of polarization of the light and seeing UV, we know they do that, but we don't know what it's like from the insect's point of view to experience like that. So in some ways, there'll be aspects of, of the experience that remain inscrutable, but the same is true of other people. <laughs> you know, there are aspects of other people's experience that will remain inscrutable to us, but nonetheless, a huge amount of understanding and bridging is possible, and I think the same is true of insects. Mm. Thank you. I, th I, I think that it's not that we, 
part of me, I think, is that not only we wouldn't understand them, I think it would make me feel inferior that I can't <laughs> sense the world the way they can. I mean, there's all these things. I can't see UV. I can't sense magnetic fields. And so I would know, like, I wouldn't, it's not that I wouldn't understand. It, it, it's like a, it's the difference of, like, not understanding another language is, like, I don't have that, like, you have the skill I don't have. Um, and I think there's just, there's a different way of looking at it instead of ignoring them, being like, oh, I don't understand you. I think it, if we really think about it, we see how limited we are in our sensory perception. And so it's a lot of, like, humans are not the exceptional ones on this earth. <laughs> A new form of imposter syndrome. <laughs> a new form of imposter syndrome. Yes, right, yeah. You know, years ago when I started work on circadian rhythms, I had more senior colleagues that were behavioral biologists that said, what are you, what are you studying a fly for if you're interested in circadian rhythms? And uh, it always struck me as uh, uh, quitting a little too early. And, you know, now we know, you know, as you, as you look at the components that are involved in regulating something like that behavior, they're the same components that we have. So how many other things are there that we can build from the bottom up that show, you know, you've, you've, we, we really do have a fly inside of us, you know, it's, it's part of our heritage. And so why wouldn't there be vestiges of some of this? And, you know, I agree completely with the issue of, you know, particular sensory uh, abilities and so forth, but there's so much that we keep running into that is uh, is tangibly uh, the same. So <clears throat> the last thing you want to do is assume that when I, to my mind, you know, again, when I was an undergraduate, I was told that you couldn't assume that if a deer was running from a lion that it was afraid, it just runs from lions. And I think that's the wrong way to think about the problem. <laughs> Um, so I'll follow up also with a, another question to you, Dr. Young. Um, research related to human well-being has generally focused on fruit flies. How could the study of other types of insects enrich our understanding of human well-being? And, and this question is going to you, but I also suspect that other folks on the panel um, can provide interesting perspectives on that. Yeah, that's a tough one, having spent so many years, you know, being grateful to this little fly. You know, part of the problem is that, problem, part of the problem of changing focus to another system is that there's so much that gets developed that you can use by others. So, you know, every, every year, every, uh, every 10 years, you have completely new tools that allow you to go deeper and deeper, and those are not just immediately transferable to other, uh, to other systems. It would be wonderful if some of those were, but uh, <clears throat> I think there's still a long way we can go asking these kinds of questions uh, in Drosophila, and you've got a, a large body of people that have developed expertise in working with them and, and uh, again, developing tools. And so I, I tend to run all that out before... Uh, throwing up your hands and going, going somewhere else for certain kinds of questions. There are other kinds of questions where it's the wrong organism. Will you oh. something and then Jonathan? Yeah. Well, I mean, if there was another insect group, I would just advocate to the group, right? This, maybe we can all agree on this, yeah. uh, that there should be a non holo metabolist insect. So fruit flies are in the holo metabola. They have an egg, larva, a pupa with a complete rearrangement in the adult stage. So I think if you wanted to have another model organism, I think we should all agree, we'll write it down now, that it should be a non holo metabolist insect, uh, perhaps something near the base of the insect tree. Uh, perhaps something dragonfly-like would be, even, would be even, even the best, I think. Let's go for it. So like maybe we have a little bit of cockroach yeah. in us too, yeah, along with that fruit fly. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, yeah, crickets as well, I think, very interesting. Mm -hmm. it's, um, I mean, it raises this big picture issue about the role of model organisms in science, and in particular in, in the life sciences, where if you think of Drosophila, there's just so much stuff you can do with Drosophila that you could not do with any other animal because it has this whole 
technology built around it. So you can use extraordinary technologies like optogenetics to study in just extraordinary detail and have incredible control over which neurons are active. And that can't be reproduced in, in bees or crickets or anything else. So when we're doing studies in Lars Chikka's lab at Queen Mary, much more low tech, and, and we're not imaging individual neurons. We're looking at whole animal behavior because um, we're not using, using Drosophila. I think we need both kinds of research, really. We, we do need to be making the most of these technologies that exist and that have been developed for specific model organisms. But we need diversity of different species as well. That's what's motivating us to try and study crickets and try and study black soldier fly larvae. Let's have insect cognition labs that are full of different species of insect. And let's try and learn some of that stuff that we still don't know about their observable behavior. I was, just, uh, I was just thinking, I mean, with this loneliness, being alone versus being together with others of your species, like locusts, uh, maybe it could be something interesting studying locusts that shift between these uh, gregarious yeah, yeah, phases yeah. and the solitary yeah. phases. I mean, see if anything is, is parallel. And I mean, I guess we do know a bit about what triggers those shifts. And it's super interesting because while they're solitary, they hate each other. And then something happens and they are suddenly very good buddies and, and they <coughs> love to be together. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be one group of organisms that could sort of maybe fit uh, or fill in the picture from, from what we have learned about yeah, being lonely uh, as a fruit fly. And I was also thinking, I mean, insects cannot only help human health through model organisms, but also like these studies uh, of leafcutter ants that have specific antibiotics yeah. uh, to, to make their fungi farming stay uh, healthy. And I mean, by studying these ants, we can hope, probably, or not probably, but hopefully we can look for or, and hopefully find um, new forms of antibiotics that would also be super helpful. And that's another way of, um, yeah, looking to insects to, to gain new insight that is uh, good for, for human health. Can we move on? Yeah. A number of people are asking a question about the implications of, doc, of, your, of your research about loneliness. Uh, how can we use this information to help understand and prevent loneliness while also mm -hmm. preventing a prescription drug culture to deve develop something that would cure, mm -hmm. quote unquote, loneliness? Mm -hmm. Do you have hopes? Well, I guess, yeah. So I guess early steps might be to look at a, at a mammal, you know, a, a research, uh, a different research model. Uh, you know, does this happen in mice, for example? Uh, are there specific areas of the brain? Are, well, or even before that, do you have changes in behavior that parallel what we see in a fly? And that would also make the comparisons that we've made, you know, they're distant comparisons to look at behavior in humans that seem to be in parallel, but I think you could gain a lot more confidence if you were looking at mice and you had molecular tools to say, yes, this behaves in a certain way in certain areas of the brain light up when the animal is isolated. And um, I think that's the, kind of, that's the kind of path I would tend to advise. Do you have, I guess I would ask, do you have worries about um, possible choices others might um, make in using your research? To All we need to do is um, invent a technique or a, or, a, or a drug that would enable us to incarcerate people more effectively, for instance. Well, I think before you get to that, you get to an appreciation of what you're doing when you incarcerate people. You know, I would, I would hope that that would be the, the thing that hits you first and that you respond to. But... Um, I don't, that would be like dreaming up new forms of torture. I don't think that, you know, I, I don't see a, anybody advocating for that uh, that I work with. <laughs> yeah, but that's a dangerous part of science. I mean, that's, that's the history of my field. I mean, anthropology, we started out as typology of one group versus the other and started making value assessments that, you know, based on your skull size and this skull size, these people 
usually the white people, were considered to be superior by their measures. And then that was used in the Holocaust as justification. And so, like, we have to be very careful in sort of how we do our science and present our science. Um, you know, so I don't know what you could do different to prevent this road, but I think we need to, I think that is a legit question um, and a concern. I think it's also the choices of the experiments you do. Um, I mean, I don't know if anyone thought about this, but the VR work we were doing was essentially target search behavior and extracting that. And I don't think it's a very long road from you know coming up with more efficient algorithms for target searching, where you can get to some pretty scary conclusions. Mm -hmm. So we made very clear decisions in the experiments that we were doing to really tie them to ecology and really be careful that they couldn't at least very easily be misconstrued into something that could be used for, let's say, weaponry or something like this. And I think you really have to think very far ahead. I know nobody, like an apple fly in an orchard, like it doesn't, but honestly, that's how a lot of things happen. That you're, you're actually only, only concerned about your little world and you don't even think about how it can be taken um, to a completely different place. So, but I think we have an obligation as scientists to do that at all times and to really think like, what is the craziest thing that somebody could do with our research? and do your best, as best you can, to be true to the science, but also be very careful that you don't open up doors um, that maybe you don't want to open from, from your ethical and moral standpoint, so. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, did you want to? Uh, yes, I mean, I think it could be a really good outcome of this research on, on loneliness if it feeds into preparation for future pandemics, because we know that we will face situations like COVID-19 in the future. And governments were flying blind at the start of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, yeah. really not in a position to make decisions on the basis of evidence. And so the, you know, the benefits of lockdowns in terms of keeping people out of intensive care could be quantified and could be seen to be very large. Mm -hmm. But the costs on the other side, the costs of imposing a lockdown yeah. on people's mental health, these were Un unquantifiable, yeah. and so people simply had to guess. And so one really good thing that could come out of this is if we work towards a situation where we have a much deeper understanding of the costs of these kinds of interventions and can weigh up the costs and benefits more accurately. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it, uh, you know, some of those that suffered the most are the youngest people in the population, those that didn't get to make those early social interactions that I think most of us think are pretty crucial. Uh, and uh, I guess you can build those up uh, after the fact, but would you want to do that again? I guess, you know, the next time around, and there will be a next time around. Even something as, as simple as the effect on weight you were describing will yeah. have health consequences yeah. decades into yeah. the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really hard to quantify. Yeah. Margaret, I wonder if you'd like to ask a question that will enable us to uh, bring this wonderful discussion to a close. <laughs> mm. This one's a short one this time. Uh, we're fortunate to have such a diverse range of e expertise. Uh, I was wondering if, if uh, any or all of you would speak to something that you have learned from one of the other speakers over the past two days. Ooh, good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're modeling now for our students. I, or you I could say, I, that think, was when you asked if we had questions for the speakers, I'm like, no, but I, I want to like talk about the things <laughs> I learned in the afternoon talks. Oh um, and so for Jessica, the, uh, the collections being moved um, on the slave ships, I had not heard that. That was new to me. Um, we, we reckon a lot with, you know, the colonial history and anthropology. So it's nice to see, see it being discussed in entomology, and, and so that, very, that was new to, new to me, and thank you for, for enlightening me to that. Um, and then uh, for your talk, Michael, I'm just so fascinated by the idea of ladybug pets for fruit flies. <laughs> 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 um, and so I just want to know more about, you know, about that. <laughs> like, that yeah. was just the coolest thing to learn, so. What constitutes a good pet? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to know what species, you know, view each other in that companion yeah. kind of way. Yeah. Great. Yes, uh, for me, I think learning is really nourishing. Uh, 
Every day I ask myself what have I learned new, and if I'm not learning new, I always Google something to read. So this uh, week was just marvelous because I learned from each person amazing, amazing things. Uh, so I'm really hoping that uh, I would find the video online so that I can listen to everybody's talk again in the privacy of my home. Mm -hmm. uh, it is just fabulous and wonderful to meet all of you. So it's really wonderful and wonderful for the audience also, the excitement and the, the question, the interaction is just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you to you both. Yeah, I thought, I thought your, uh, your description of these symbiotic interactions in mosquitoes was something that was completely new and extraordinarily uh, high potential. And, uh, you know, there have been so many attempts to do something uh, about malaria that have hit dead ends, and this sounds like a, an extraordinary new opportunity. And your, your uh, uh, plantings with plants, <laughs> with, with propellant plants versus the crop that you want, uh, uh, and the weed killers, those were all uh, fascinating to hear about. Completely Thank new. you. I will, I will go back and tell the team that they received a compliment from a Nobel laureate. They will be very happy. Jonathan, did you have Yes, I was, I was thinking, I mean, I've learned a huge amount, but one thing we've learned is that there is an audience. Now, we've, we've learned that there is an audience for hard discussions about the science and ethics of insects. And I think that wasn't really obvious at all you know, at the point of plan planning this event, uh, you know, it was a brave thing in a way to make this the theme. And I think it's been an ingenious theme because we've seen over and over again how important and urgent and huge these issues are and how entangled insects are with questions of sustainability, how to live together, how to preserve the natural environment. And that's a, a, a great discovery. And I think you know, the more conversations like this we can have the better we, we know people are ready for them and we need to keep that going and just try and talk to more and more people get these conversations happening in more and more different places i i think we're at a very precarious point in humanity i think we're at a point where there's a lot of potential and i think there's a lot of possibility for destruction as well that we're already seeing and I think we have a choice to make and how we're going to go forward and I think what I learned from each of these speakers is that whether you're taking it from you know an ecosystem or ethics or human well-being or food security or biodiversity or living in the global south, that there are real questions that we need to answer and real avenues that need to be pursued. Insects are part of these questions, but there's also a lot of work that needs to be done on a lot of fronts. I think we covered so many things, right? This was not a conversation about insects. It was a conversation about the role of governments and corporations and, and, and you know, uh, ethic, uh, ethical the science ethics and, and so many things. And I think that it really shows that we need to have more conversations like this. I think this conference is a very good example where bringing together people from very diverse backgrounds is needed at so many levels today. And I hope that the people in the audience continue to have these conversations in their communities and at your school and seek out people different from you to talk to them about suffering or loneliness or whatever you talk about, right? Because I think this is what is needed today and this is what is going to drive change. Yeah, I guess uh, <laughs> I'm the last one out. Um. No, I think, like you said, Sejanet, it's. I think also I've learned something from each and every um, speaker, uh, and I've really enjoyed being in a setting like this. Uh, really, all of it, the entire conference, with this much contact, also with the student groups. Um, 
And I think at some early stage, I guess yesterday, um, I talked to someone about that we, we have too few sort of playgrounds in science or for scientists and or in academia where we can sort of have advanced discussions, but still on sort of a, a level where we are allowed to ask this sort of dumb questions or say that we don't know the words in, in that sort of a discipline. So I really think it is so rewarding um, to be part of a, a setting like this mm. and to, to exchange, to listen and to have conversations and to, to exchange opinions about such a broad concept. And like you were saying, it, in a way, this is how we should talk about insects because they influence every part of our society. They do influence all this food security, the ethics, everything. So, yeah, I think this conference really sets a good example of how we should talk about insects, include them in all sort of walks of life and all parts of society. So thank you for thank you. being <laughs> part of this. Um, I, I like everyone has said, I, I really feel like I've learned a lot. And I think the thing that I learned, uh, as I do whenever I've had the good fortune of speaking in an inter interdisciplinary setting like this, is how different our styles of presentation are. Mm. I actually find this fascinating because different schools, uh, the way that we present data, the amount of data that we show, the way that we use the stage and the podium, the way that we talk about insects, the vocabulary that we use is slightly different, even though we might be talking about very similar things. So I've actually learned a lot just from my fellow presenters about science communication. And so thanks for sharing your different styles of, of presentation. That's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've commented a number of times about the ways in which um, uh, TED Talks have transformed our process of selecting speakers, because many of you have done TED or TED-like talks. Uh, I did say to Jonathan, you wrecked it for all future philosophers, because uh, some of you may know that philosophers haven't always been among the most <laughs> engaging presenters at the Nobel Conference there. You heard me say that. And he has now wrecked it for future philosophers. The bar has been set differently. <laughs> but that's absolutely true, so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Interesting, we often try to make there be at least some kind of a thread connecting a particular conference to the next conference. And uh, interestingly, that was one of the reasons that we chose to um, end our conference with someone who does research on the fruit fly, uh, who has done research on, on circadian rhythms because next year's conference, and I have to say, I came up with this title, I'm very proud of it, Sleep Unraveled. All you Shakespeare scholars in the room will get the joke. <laughs> uh, so, and just a nod to what people were saying about the diversity, the breadth of, of um, disciplines that will be represented here. We have psychologists, we have neuroscientists, we have uh, cultural historians, and we have someone with degrees in performance art and theology who describes herself as the Knapp Bishop and has founded the Knapp Ministry. So it is going to be a conference that is going to transform, and she has a very serious social justice agenda connected with that. It's going to blow your minds, and um, you're going to realize that you all deserve nine hours a night. So that happens next year, October 1 and 2. Please mark your calendars now. It's going to be, um, it's going to be dynamite. It's going to be really spectacular. So drive safely home and get a good night's sleep and dream of insects. <laughs>